You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash The Options Insider, or via questions at TheOptionsInsider.com. This episode is sponsored by Demand Derivatives, a startup futures exchange and clearinghouse trading the world's major assets in a creative new way. You already trade on an exchange. Here is your chance to own one. Before they approach large strategic partners for funding, the pioneering team at Demand Derivatives launched a crowdfunding portal so that regular traders have the chance to buy shares. Learn more and become a part of this revolutionary fintech project now at demandderivatives.com slash crowdfunding. And now, it's time for the show that breaks down the options market from unusual activity alerts to market analysis, strategy overviews, listener questions, and much more. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. It's time to hit the option block with your host, Mark Longo from the Options Insider Media Group and co-hosts. Uncle Mike Tussaw from St. Charles Wealth Management, along with Mark the Greasy Meatball Sebastian and Andrew the Rock Lobster Joe Venazzi from OptionPit.com. And now, get ready to hit the Option Block. All right, everybody. That music means it is Thursday. It is noon central. 1 p.m. Eastern, it is time once again for episode due here of the old OB, a.k.a. your bi-weekly source for all things options related. My name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, coming at you from the Options Insider Radio Network. Reminding if you like what you hear, this show, anything we do here on the mighty Options Insider Radio Network. Soon be getting a cool new coat of paint. Stay tuned for that. Maybe even this week. Who knows? We'll see. We'll see what we can get all. Probably not that soon, but soon. So stay tuned for that. But of course, keep rating and reviewing wherever you get this content. It really does help new folks discover the content these days. And of course, keep those questions and comments coming too, particularly for a day like today. It is Mail Block Thursday. You folks get to take the reins here on the old OB. So keep hitting us up. We do love to hear from you guys and gals out there. Let's see who we're hearing from on the old program today. First, let's go out to the quiet, the sleepy, the tranquil. I think they were a little bit nervous this morning, but I think they're happier now. It is St. Charles, where we are joined once again by Uncle Mike Tussaud from St. Charles Wealth Manager. Uncle Mike, welcome back to the program. You know, it was looking a little dicey for the Uncle Mike prospects earlier in the session, but I think now you got a big smile on your face, sir. Is that the case? Hey, everything is... And then this reminds me of a lyric from my good friend Coolio, who has no clue who I actually am. Uh, been spending most of my nights living in a day trader's paradise. That's kind of what it seems like these days. You're lying. I've seen you and Coolio hanging out. I've seen photos of you two together. You guys go way back. Uncle Mike and Coolio, they're, they're just like freaking frack listeners. Good buddies. Wouldn't have guessed it. But hey, what do they say? Opposites attract out there. Speaking of opposites, he doesn't get more opposite at least personality-wise, from Uncle Mike, <laughs> then the meatball, Mr. Mark Sebastian from OptionPit.com, by way of Carmen Line Capital, by way of a Tex-Mex restaurant near you. Mr. Meatball, welcome back to the program to you as well, sir. 
It is great to be here. Glad, uh, glad I can be a part of the ceremony today. It is quite the ceremony. So let's kick it off with the trading block. It's time to break down the latest topics, trades, and trends in the world of options. It's time for the trading block. All right, everybody, welcome to the trading block, the portion of the show where we break down what the heck is trading? What is lighting it up out there on our collective screens? And like I said, to Uncle Mike looked a little dicey for him earlier in the session. If he was a NASDAQ bull, it might still be a little dicey for him. I know he's not really a big NASDAQ guy, so that'll help him out in this case. Because coming into showtime now, seems like, seems like, I put it out there in quotes. It seems like the worm may be turning a little bit. We've got, you know, after spending most of the early session in the red, now we got the S&P ever so slightly in the green, up about a tenth of a percentage point out there. Of course, we got the Dow up about two tenths of a percentage point after also being in the red earlier in the session. The NASDAQ can't really seem to shake the blues today. It's still in the red, even though not as bad as it was off about a quarter of a percent out there. And of course, all this means... Vol was getting jacked up, then they come into showtime, starting to come off their VIX right before we kicked off the show. Is that right around a 21? That puts it still up from our last show on Monday, up about a point and a half. We'll see if we can hold that bid even by the end of the show. We shall see. And of course, VVIX, Vol is moving, so you can't expect VVIX to get much lower than it is right now. It's right around a 110 come into showtime, puts it down about three points vxx a product you folks love to fade is indeed getting its fade on coming into showtime it was at about a 1260 that puts it still up from our last show on monday up about four tenths of a point member it was shy that 12 handle not too long ago so getting a little bit of that juice back we'll see if it can give back the erosion again before the end of the session and vol q aka the at the money ball of the NASDAQ 100, also feeling a little frothy coming into showtime. It's about 25 and a half. That puts it up about one and a quarter points from last show. And again, kind of hard to argue with that as well. Ball and NASDAQ in particular has been moving quite a bit. So uh, hard to argue that Vol Q is too low these days. Let's go around the horn, see what's lighting up our respective tapes. Let's go back around the horn, the opposite of the way we came. Let's start out in the land of greasy meatballs and Tex-Mex burritos. Mr. Meatball, sir, a lot of vol action. I know you've been leaning heavy towards the downside in vol these days. You were talking on vol views last week about the great sucking sound of vol getting pulled south of the 20 handle. We did see it. Of course, we did also see what always follows it these days, which is the move right back up to around 22 or so. Now coming off that again. So what's been lighting up your tape out there this week from a vol perspective, sir? having technical issues in the back there. Luckily, we got Uncle Mike to help sort it out. Mr. Uncle Mike, sir, what's lighting up your tape? And now this Uncle Mike type of day, sir. Uh, you know, at least slightly. Uh, so just in looking at what is the things I like to look at during the day, <coughs> um, uh, Bitcoin looked like it was going to fall out of bed. And uh, now it's back to break even again, uh, at least on the day. And uh, so that was definitely something that caught my eye. I mean, I don't have any specific positions in Bitcoin in and of itself, but um, uh, the fact that... Did you uh, just start your breakdown with Bitcoin? That may be a first, sir. Maybe maybe we're in a new era just from that right there. (laughs) That shows that it's towards the end. If even I'm talking about it, then that shows it's almost over. But uh, full disclosure, I don't own any Bitcoin. Um, The only thing I would do in Bitcoin is maybe the Jovanazzi straddle that he does, but I'll I'll let him talk about that a little bit more. But uh, anyway, um, but uh, I think that... uh, with, with the way with which we started today, we had that going on. Um, bonds were actually opening higher on the day a little bit, uh, with yields actually being a little bit lower. But uh, now it's come down a little bit, the uh, the bonds in and of itself, the 10-year. And so uh, the story for that for me right now is actually I'm going to actually uh, be in a position uh, potentially tomorrow that I have not been in in quite a while with uh, these covered calls I've been selling on IEF and that uh, I might be in the money, which um, uh, I I don't know what to do with myself. What are you supposed to do when a covered call goes in the money? I mean, do I just run in circles and scream, shout? I mean, what do I do? If only we'd cover that about 74 times on the strategy block, so you'd be all set. I know. I need to figure that out. So uh, with that, 
um, what I'm kind of excited about is that with my IEF covered calls, um, taking in a lot of premium on that through the last few months. And so, uh, I'm essentially doing a wheel and there's a chance that the, uh, IEF might get called out on me tomorrow. Um, uh, just depending on where, where it ends and where it is. And so, uh, but if it does, I'm very cool with that because of the fact that, uh, Unless we have some type of major, major, major freakish move in the bonds today and tomorrow, it's not going to be in the money that much. It's not going to be out of the money that much. And so uh, I like it because of the fact that um, even if it does go in the money and I get called away, then um, it's really not moving enough to where it's uh, going to mess things up for me too badly on it. So i uh, kind of excited about being on the other side of this for, for a change over the course of the last few months. So looking at that, and then right now in the S&P 500, uh, we still have not, at least on the day, we have not gone, I'm, I'm looking at SPX, we have not gone above 3,900 yet on the day. Uh, we're five points away from it right now, so um, there's a, I mean, there's as good a chance as any that we could go over it today, but it looks like that initially, just in the price movement of the day within the SPX, uh, 3,900 is somewhat of a... Uh, point of resistance, at least so far today. Now, we were above it yesterday, so I can't really say it's a strong point of resistance, at least not in my opinion. So we could still uh, end above it today. But that does seem to be, uh, once again, kind of like I, what I like to refer to as a magnet number uh, in the stock market, is that we're kind of staying close to the 3,900 level. So we have that. And then uh, we, ha and we have almost no movement in silver right now. So in terms of what I'm looking at, uh, that's uh, where we're at. So I think that <clears throat> we have two really key numbers right now that we can look at between the S&P 500 and the VIX. The VIX, of course, being the 20 handle and the SPX being the 3900 handle. Uh, keep in mind that in this marketplace, a 50-point move is not something that's really all too crazy. So if you look at the highs of yesterday and the lows of today, so the morning highs of yesterday, and the lows of today, we have roughly a 90-point range in the S&P 500. So it, with the day trader's paradise with which we are living in right now, uh, it could easily make a run for 4,000 tomorrow, uh, just based on the movement with which we have, although I don't think we're going to get that much of a run tomorrow. Or we could be making another run down towards 3850. You never know. So what I'm seeing in this marketplace right now, and I'm curious to hear what Mark will have to say in terms of uh, realized volatility and the things with which he does, is that we're getting a lot of movement in these markets recently. And it's a lot of daily movement. But what's different about now than what we had uh, in years, in, over the last couple of years, a lot of times when we would get really volatile in the market, there'd be a lot of overnight movement. We have not been getting that lately. We've been getting some overnight movement, but not a ton. Because if you look at the overnight action of the S&P mini, we did not have a lot of movement overnight. We had a little bit of a drop probably around six in the morning today. Uh, but relatively speaking to um, what has happened over the last couple of years with the overnight gaps, we've not had a very gappy market, but we have had a very uh, volatile market during the day, during the cash trading hours. So that's what's lighting up my tape right now. And I will pass it back to the marks. I'm still just flummoxed that you kick things off in the crypto world, sir, which means I have to, of course, follow suit. And you're right. It is quite the bloodletting out there across all of the major cryptocurrencies. Like everyone's hitting the exit button right now. Bitcoin was threatening to break the 50,000 handle not too long ago, listeners, at about almost 52,000 right now, 51,780. So down about 7.3%. Still XRP, all the rest, all taking hits. ETH off about 6%, 1,600 right now, but it got lower intraday. By the way, can I just say, I'm looking at Coindesk right now. The huge article, top of Coindesk. Bitcoin options traders positioned for gains to 80,000, question mark. Welcome to the party, Coindesk. This is why you have to listen to the crypto rundown. We're literally the only people out there talking about this stuff. And we've been talking about the size OI on the 80,000 and yes, the 100,000 strike for weeks now on the crypto rundown. So if you listen to that show, you got it weeks before the schmoes over there at Coindesk decided to finally start looking at OI out there in crypto options. But I digress. A plug there for the crypto rundown if you're not listening. Now let's see. 
if the greasiest of meatballs has solved all of his technical issues. Mr. Meatball, sir, are you back? Are you alive? What is lighting up your tape today, sir? Yeah, my my technical in, uh, my I had a lobster that was a technical problem. Apparently, whenever you join to, yourself uh, to a lobster, to bad solve. things happen, sir. Yes, indeed. But uh, I have I have solved the lobster issues, and uh, we're good to go. Yeah, you know what I what I really want to talk about is the Russell two thousand, which has gotten absolutely mm-hmm. obliterated. Uh, it was down on the lows today, eleven uh, percent off its all time high. Just a crazy, crazy sell-off in about a week. Uh, absolutely uh, face-punched. Um, the RVX, which is the Russell 2000 volatility index, was trading uh, on the open almost 14 points higher than the VIX, which, to put things in perspective, folks, is c- the type of things we've seen at its absolute, absolute most stretched points. Volatility was really high. Uh, in options on RUT and IWM. Uh, meanwhile, the yeah, the S and P 500 uh, really did you know decent in day ranges, but has not really done you know 50 points in two days is good for you know two thirds of a percent you know uh, a, a day. That's not exactly crazy movement. Uh, which is why the VIX has been hanging around 20. And maybe we haven't gotten some of the moves that we were looking for in the volatility futures, although they did briefly get perky this morning when we were down about 25 points. But uh, in the end, uh, you know, the S&P has had a nice little turnaround. We're now slightly green. Uh, The NASDAQ is uh, about the only red on the on the book. And the Russell 2000 has had a pretty dramatic 50-point uh, swing, which in the Russell 2000 actually means something because uh, that's a 2.5% uh, a, a uh, interday move. So that's a really nice move for the, the Russell 2000. Uh, GameStop had earnings and uh, subsequently dropped $60 and is now up on the day. A lot of the meme stocks are getting a little bit of a bid. Uh, we've seen some of the uh, economy reopening stocks really start to uh, really start to perk up today. The the Biden's going to get 200 million jabs out uh, in his first hundred days instead of 100 million is uh, I, I think pushing markets higher. Uh, shows kind of the effort to get the vaccine. I mean, if uh, if our media personnel are in Chicago are able to get the vaccine, then I think just about anybody should be able to get the vaccine here shortly. Um, but uh, you know, th- that's kind of the, the major pieces I've seen. I've seen. Um, yeah. I think the, the big story for the week is the Russell 2000. And then of course, you know, it's interesting that crypto is selling off with the blow up in NFTs because in order to have an NFT, which stands for non fungible token uh you are you need ether uh they're all built on the ether network so just as they're uh they're taking some of these off the high we're seeing uh tokens on ether start to uh to really heat up i was uh thinking that what we need to do is put an nft together to fund uh of the boat in the suez canal to finance getting that boat out of the suez canal (laughs) tugboat for that thing (laughs) A tugboat so, NFT, that'd be nice. I know. Well, I'm going to turn that that uh, that beached beached um, uh, oil tanker into an NFT. I think I'm going to make millions. I like it. I like what you're doing there. And you're right. It is nice to be considered doubly essential by our local Chicago government, both financial and media. We cover both both realms here, so we're, we're doubly essential. So we're proud to be uh, to be getting immunized here <laughs> in the city of Chicago. Let's see what's not immunized from volatility. Let's see what's rolling and rocking out here in the markets. And and Meatball hit on a bunch of it here. A lot of things are lighting it up. By the way, if you want more small caps, stay tuned. We're going to have a great TWIFO coming up in about almost exactly an hour, one thirty here. We're going to have Dan Grams back on joining us. He's always great. And it's going to be probably a deep dive into all things small cap. I got a feeling. The folks at Fussy are going to have a lot to share on that front. We always talk about that VIX to RBX spread and everything else there. There's a lot popping off on that front out there, so we'll get to it all in a little bit. But let's see what's lighting it up right now. VIX pretty active right now, 303,000 contracts on the tape as of a few minutes ago. That's more than half of its ADB, ever so slightly. The ADB is just a little bit shy of 600K 
right now out there. And Big Slam, but this week's keeps up. That ADV is probably going to tick back up over 600K. Not not too long from now. Spy at almost three and a half million coming in. That's pretty robust as well. The ADV is about four and three quarters million out there. The S 621,000. That's pretty much right around half of its ADV, which is about 1.2, almost one and a quarter million out there. The Q's doing some paper already north of a million, 1.2 million contracts up in the Q's. Of course, not surprising, NASDAQ is on fire of late in all directions and all sizes and all shapes and certainly from a volume perspective. ADV about 1.6, almost 1.65 million. And the small caps, <laughs> at least just through the lens of IWM, we'll get to all the paper in ruts and all going on at CME and everything else and Russell 2000 a little bit later today. But IWM closing in on a million contracts already, listeners. 963,000 contracts on the tape that compares to an adb of shy of 700k 681 that's already really inflated i mean iwm has been doing some paper of late and yet we're already pushing a million i can't remember the last time we came close to breaking a million in small caps it's been a little while all right let's go on out to the top 10 the most active single name see what you folks are trading on your hot little trading screens today cost you 223,000 contracts to break into the top 10. So that's fairly decent. That's you no know, buck 50, buck 60, like you might see on some light days, even buck 30 over there. I get you all the way to American Airlines, number 10, number nine, AMD. AMD punching its way back into the top 10. Interesting for AMD. It seems to break in there on days when things are moving, when things are very active. On light volume days, AMD not in there. But AMD is like a, it's a heavy hitter. It's a heavy volume day hitter. Good for 239,000 contracts today. Number eight. Facebook back in the top 10 as well, 268,000. Obviously, some interesting discussions going on down there in D.C. about what to do about these protections for online platforms when it comes to content. Obviously, a very central debate to the heart of the Internet, and it's going on, at least kicking off down there in D.C., and that's going to have a lot to do with Facebook's future. So good for 268,000 contracts. Number seven, a little stock you may have heard of, Gamay. Maybe it's called, I think it's French, ticker symbol game, GME, <laughs> at about 331,000 contracts already. They just had earnings. Are we even pretending that GameStop still sells gaming retail and that's their business? Because <laughs> uh, everything else that's happened in the last couple of months has kind of dwarfed everything else that they do by several orders of magnitude. If they're smart, they should just be in the unleashing equity business as quickly as they possibly can. Dilute the hell out of this thing. And hey, you might have a viable company when it's left standing. The stock could be back around 10 bucks again, but you know what? Your company will have made so much money that it won't really matter at this point. And then you could do whatever the heck you want. You could pivot to block, whatever the hell you want to do. You'll have the capital for it. Right now, 331,000 contracts for game. Number six, our friends across the street, Boeing, 348,000 contracts. Lighting it up again out there. I'm not sure what's moving out there in Boeing land today. Let's see if I can pull them up and see. Boeing up six and a half bucks or nearly 3%, 245. So having a nice little pop out there today. Good for 348,000 contracts. Number five, Palantir. It's always up there these days, and it's up there again today. 411,000 contracts out there in Palantir. Palantir up about half a buck or a little over 2%, trading about 22.34 right now. AMC back in the top 10 as well at number four, 468,000. Once you get beyond GameStop, AMC is kind of the next name everyone talks about in the Mimi landscape. And yeah, it's looking pretty Mimi today, up another buck 70, even though it was shy of the 10 handle. Not too long ago. This one just keeps having fits and starts all over the place. Good for 469,000 contracts. Number three, it's Neo at 557,000 contracts. Then we jump up again to number two. You know who number two and number one are at this point. Number two, Tesla closing in on Apple right now. 834,000 contracts on the tape in Apple. That's A, a good day for Tesla and B, kind of a light day. For Apple, Tesla's only moving two and a half bucks right now, about four tenths of a percent. So not a huge swing here for Tesla. Looks like it's had about a 30 point range on the day. That's a little bit more. And Apple, number one, the big dog, 887,000 contracts. That's still pretty light. Usually we see it at 1.1, 1.2 even sometimes this time of day. But right now, 887,000. There's just so much other stuff trading. That is probably siphoning off some of the volume that always used to go to Apple. In terms of our most biased paper out here today, looks like it's not actually game. 
And it's not actually AMC. It's actually Boeing, our friends across the street. 79% of that nearly 350,000 contracts coming on the call side of the ledger. Fascinating. I would not have guessed that one. Let's go on out to the earnings. Front course Tuesday, we had Game and Adobe. Everyone's still mourning the death of Flash. RIP Flash. <laughs> <laughs> crappy program that it was wednesday we had general mills kb homes restoration hardware thursday today the meatballs favorite darden restaurants as well as grow generation that's kind of in that sundial category let's hit a couple of these we have actually move results reports for a bunch of these hot off the presses just coming in right before showtime here from our friends over there at orats let's hit restoration hardware first they were yesterday after the bell they're at a whopping 485.11 when they announced their earnings, they were pricing in 9.2% and they delivered, get this listeners, 6.6%. So what a surprise, underperforming from an earnings volatility perspective. Put them in the category with literally everybody else these days. Who else we got here? Let's go to Do oh, Darden's Restaurants, the home of Olive Garden, all you can eat breadsticks and salad, the meatballs, literally favorite place to go in the world. Let's see, they were at... They're popping off actually before the bell this morning. They were at 133.93 before their announcement. They were pricing in 6.2% and they delivered a whopping 2.9%. <laughs> Yet again, vol annihilation post earnings. Let's see if we're four for four here. Let's go to KB Homes. They were yesterday after the bell, 43.39 going into their announcement. They priced in 6.7%. They delivered, take a wild guess, listeners, 3.1%. Yes, pretty much half. So far, we're three for three. Listen, let's see if we can go four for four. Go out to everyone's favorite, Grow Generation. Closed at 45.81. They popped off after the bell yesterday. They were pricing in a whopping 12.8%, so nearly 13%. They delivered 5.3. So, yeah, we're four for four. <laughs> Just dramatic underperformance. That's pretty much in keeping with this season, listeners. It's 77% <laughs> right now, average. For And this this week, so far, the worst by far, 52%. You're getting pretty much 50 cents on the dollar from an earnings vol perspective. So that's not exactly looking robust. But maybe, maybe there are some signs for hope on the horizon. We've got Chewy coming up next week on the 30th after the bell. They were at 79 even. We have an earnings move report for them hot off the presses as well. They are pricing in, let's see, 775. And get this, in the past, they've moved 460, 462. So if past is prologue, that will not work out well for them. <laughs> Lulu, they of the sheer yoga pants infamy from many years ago, but I can't let it go. It's just too funny. 30731, another lofty valuation out there. They're pricing in 20 bucks. In the past, they've moved 26 and a half. So hey, someone got the memo there. In Lulu, let's go on out to Micron as well. 83 bucks even. They're pricing in 543. In the past, they've moved 527. So that's a little dangerous in this environment we're in right now. Let's, oh, let's go to my favorite name out there, Walgreens Boots Alliance. I just love saying that. It sounds like it's straight out of Star Trek. They're popping off on the 31st after the bell. 5178 is where they were as of this report. They were pricing in 243. In the past, they moved 288. So it seems like someone got the memo out there as well. Let's go to one more really quick. Let's go to Dave and Buster's ticker symbol play. It's just a great ticker. They were at 4281. They're popping off on the 31st after the bell. So next week they were pricing in $4 and 19 cents in the past. They've moved a whopping 336. So extra juice in the Dave and Buster's realm. You can maybe argue that it's warranted. That segment has certainly been aggressively impacted by COVID. But if you look at the past history of every earnings announcement for the last year, you probably want to say it's not exactly warranted. But we'll keep an eye on all of these as we keep on rolling into our next segment. It is time for the Odd Block. It's time to break down the most interesting, unusual, and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by TheOptionsInsider.com. It's time for The Odd Block. All right, everybody. 
Let's do it. Let's dive right into it. Let's unleash the Eye of Sauron. Actually, even before we do that, Mr. Meatball, I know you're just glued laser-like focus forget vix forget everything else you're talking about how excited slash glued to your screens are you for the darden's restaurants earnings sir oh i it's the most important earnings call of the year all right well i it's what i like to call the salad and breadstick gauge how how strong are decent salad and breadsticks at uh, making up for terrible red sauce. And, uh, you know, we will find our answer shortly. <laughs> Unlimited salad and breadsticks. I can make up for a lot of other things that are going wrong in a company, sir. I, I defy you to challenge the power of unlimited salad and breadsticks. You know what else has some great power? We just talked last time you were on Meatball on Monday. We were just talking about Bill.com. We're already talking about them again because they're back in the gaze of the eye of Sauron. Last time we talked about him on Monday, listeners, he profiled someone. Looks like they were drawing a pretty aggressive line in the sand on the April 115, puts 10,368 times. And then it seems just apropos then to go back, not that far, go back to February 22nd to profile and analyze the last time we talked about Bill.com. So we did talk about it before. I wasn't sure if it was a newcomer or not, but we had talked about him once before on the show and that was back on february 22nd at the time listeners we profiled what looked like to us a similar trade the march 140 puts going up on the bid the well on the bid in question mark this market was atrocious it was 45 cents at four dollars and ten cents that's that's the kind of thing that just shouldn't even be to set that's that's going to dissuade people from trading at that point that's so bad you might as well have no bid at 100 it's, it's useless but anyway i digress uh, these went up for 65 cents we all thought it looked like a pretty pretty interesting line in the sand this wasn't that aggressive the stock was 182.29 when this trade went up there were earnings but not in this cycle they're on may 6 so it looks like it was kind of your standard old not that aggressive line in the sand. And Mr. Meatball, this one got a little close to the fire there. <laughs> the stock took a bit of a drubbing, to say the least, out there for Bill.com. Because coming into right now, it's at 144, pretty much even off about 45 cents or about a third of a percent. Of course, this thing, when we mentioned it, was at 182. And that was, unfortunately for this trader, not quite the apex, but pretty darn close to it. <laughs> it got up as high as 195 in that February time frame. But this thing pretty much just turned right around and never really looked back up again. It sold off. Actually, during the lifespan of these puts, Mr. Meatball, it got a little dicey there because Bill did break through the 140 handle. So it sold off over 40-odd handle. That's a pretty aggressive sell-off. Down to 138.81. But then it bounced back up. By the 12th, it was trading 160 again. And then it sold off again, going into expiration. This guy had to sweat a little bit for his 65 cents. But he finally got it. Looks like on expiration, the stock closed 146.34. So it looks like our friend ended up keeping all of the money that he sold. He got close to a million bucks on that, about 960,000. So not a bad trade. It got a little dicey there. <laughs> <laughs> for a few minutes, which is probably why this paper we talked about this week, Mr. Meatball, seems like a similar trade. Could go out on a limb and say it's probably the same guy. He's writing that line in the sand again. This time he's going even farther out of the money, Mr. Meatball. He went to the 115 puts. So, A, do you concur that our friend there, he did all right on his puts, but he had to sweat for it a little bit? And then, B, do you doubly concur that this print we talked about on Monday Maybe it makes a little bit more sense in hindsight and perhaps our friend coming back for another tilt at the bill.com windmill, sir. Yeah, I think that you're right on both ends. I, I think that, yeah, you know, sweated out, but he did all right. Now he's come back for more. Uh, so it makes a, makes a ton of sense. Yeah, it seemed like a pretty safe line in the sand, the 140 strike, but he actually had to sweat it a little bit there, listeners. So interesting stuff. Maybe he actually wanted the stock. These were still open at expiration, so he didn't get any stock, and obviously they went out worthless. Uh, so yeah, he made close to a million bucks for sweating a little bit out there, listeners. So yeah, interesting. We'll keep an eye on these, and as you said, on Monday, we'll keep an eye on these 115 puts. This guy's got a decent track record, even though it got dicey there, so... 
We'll keep an eye on these, see if this bill.com sell-off continues, if these puts become relevant on the April 115 strike, or if perhaps he's got some free money. He did less size this time, so maybe he got a little bit spooked (laughs) by the last one. Actually, ironically enough, this has got to be the same guy because these puts went up at the exact same price, 65 cents. So that's clearly this guy's line in the sand. He likes out of the money puts trading for 65 cents with roughly a month and change to go. And that's pretty much what he got here. So this is probably the same person. We'll keep an eye on these and see if he gives up that million or if he makes more. Let's go on out now. Again, we're going to do all, all way back machine today, which ironically enough, you, you think a lot of paper going up today. You think be a lot of stuff hot and heavy today. That's interesting. Actually, not a lot. So let's pay off our just enormous back catalog listeners of trades we have to watch. But going back out now, set your way back machines to March 1st, listeners. This takes us back to Nuance Communications, ticker symbol Nuan, N-U-A-N. Trading right now, right around 41.65 or so off. Not quite a buck, but close to it, off nearly 2%. Here at the time, back on March 1st, we profiled the March 38 puts going up 15,633 times for a whopping 11 cents, listeners. (laughs) These were a dime bid at 25 cents. It looked like they were lying the sand. I, I recall at the time... I believe it was the meatball on the show with us, not really liking these, saying, what the hell are you doing selling 11 cent puts? <laughs> but that's where we were, listeners. The stock at the time was 45.12. So these were seven bucks and change out of the money. They had a little bit of ways to go. They had not quite a full month, but pretty close to it out there. So interesting stuff. Again, no earnings in this cycle. Their next announcement is on May 5th. So this looks like pretty much your standard outside of earnings cycle, a little bit of downside premium harvesting. And the stock closed listeners at exactly 45.01 on expiration. So these puts, <laughs> go figure, we're still open. Looks like our friend made a whopping $171,000 for his effort. Mr. Meatball, do you A, concur with that? And B, do you recall not being a huge fan of these just if for no other reason than the 11 cent premium, sir? Yeah, I still don't like, even though they won, I still don't like the risk reward. I it. You know, sometimes things make sense. Other times they don't. This is not not one I love. So, uh, you know, I'll just leave it at that. Do you have a threshold where you won't go under on the premium harvesting side? Is it 15 I, cents? Is it 25 I, cents? Where do you draw the line, sir? Well, it really depends on the, line, on the size of the stock. So, but I usually like to get at least 1% of the value for the premium sale. So, uh, you know, will I sell a 10 cent option on a, on a 50 cent, on a $5 stock? Yeah. You know what? Yeah, I will. Will I sell a 10 cent option on a hundred dollar stock? No, I need at least a buck. So it's just very much how I approach things. It's all relative value relative to the, uh, the, uh, the underlying. All right. Let's see if we get some relative value out of our last name. We're going back to February 18th. Listeners, to NRG. I haven't talked about this one in a little while. At the time, looked like there was some put love going up out there to the tune of 9,659 of the March 28 puts going up for 45 cents, lifting the offer. They got all they could at that level. The stock at the time was about 39 and a half. And there were earnings coming up. This was a straight up earnings play because there were earnings uh, about a week later on February 25th. And it looks like our friend after that trade, listeners, he wasn't done. He needed some more because those traded on the 18th, a total of nearly 12,000 traded on the 18th, but then another 10, almost 11,000 trading the next day. Pretty much all of that additive to the OI. So about 22,000 total were open at the end of the next day. They traded for similar levels the next day around, looks like around 47 cents or so. So now we have some size open on this strike, about 22,000 out there. But it looks like they didn't, ironically enough, They didn't hang around for long on these bad boys because they drove them all the way up to about 22,000 open on the 19th. They had earnings on the 25th. So these usually when we see these plays, they like to ride them through earnings. You know, we counsel against it a lot here on the show. That's like going over the falls there on Niagara. You don't really know what's going to happen. It's kind of out of your hands at that point. We have counseled before, maybe taking them off a little bit earlier. And that is Exactly what our friend here did. They came back in a couple of days later on the 23rd, right before earnings, two days before the earnings, and decided to take these bad boys off. They traded about 20000 and change on that day for prices around $0.40. Cents. So 
they effectively kind of scratched these bad boys. I mean, they lost like a nickel on Siong, on a good chunk of them maybe, but still, nickel, maybe a, not quite a dime, seven cents on these, but still. So they lost a little bit. Looks like they decided for whatever reason they wanted to get the heck out of Dodge. Maybe they didn't get the pre-earnings move that they wanted, but this was a very short-term trade. They put it on. They didn't like the setup. They didn't like how it was going, or maybe they just didn't want to get that close to earnings. Either way, they got the heck out of Dodge. Uh, actually, I, I went and looked. They took them off on the 23rd for prices ranging. They closed at 40 cents, but they took them off on prices ranging from 40 to 50. So actually, it looks like they scratched them pretty much. Maybe actually made a couple of cents. But still, for the most part, let's just say they pretty much scratched these, averaging around 45 cents. So interesting stuff here. Mr. Meatball, we don't see this too often. Usually, we see the opposite of this. People put on long premium trades. In fact, I can't think of a single long premium trade that we've profiled over the last almost six months that's really been a huge home run where they actually took it off in time. Usually they, they put them on, something happens that it's a huge home run, and then they sit on it, and then they lose it all. <laughs> this one was kind of the opposite. They put it on, not a heck of a lot happened, and then they took it off right away. So, so what are your thoughts on this one? Not even going through the earnings, sir, but just getting the heck out of Dodge a couple of days before the announcement. You know, maybe it was a vol play. You know, they just said, you know what, this is too cheap ahead of earnings, and I'm going to throw this on. Or, you know, it was a, a prop shop or, or somebody that didn't want to take it through earnings. Uh, probably did not have stock associated with the trade. That would be why um, they would be more aggressive, right? A lot of the ones that were they win and then lose. They probably have stock position that corresponds to the trade. This one, they did not, would be my guess. And that's why they took the profit that they took. All right. And we're going to take your questions. We're going to take on all comers because it's Mail Block Thursday. It's time to take your seat on the all-star panel as we read your emails, tweets, Facebook messages, website comments, and much more. It's time for The Mail Block. All right, everybody. Let's do it. Let's unleash The Mail Block. By the way, if you haven't played along yet, get in there. Round one, week one, the Sweet 16, drawing to a close tomorrow for our return, the triumphant return of our broker madness battle royale as the kids like to say out there. Let's go look at our matchups again really quickly. You guys can vote the links on our Twitter, on our Facebook, pretty much stock twits everywhere. I think our producer is going to put it in the chat now as well if you're listening live. If you haven't voted, get on in there. Make your voice heard. This one's a little bit different because not only you get to vote for the battles, but you also we left extra slots there for you folks to give your feedback on your broker, what you like, what you don't like. If you want us to share it, we can. So we give you folks a little bit of a megaphone. This is your chance. Vent your spleen. You love them. You hate them. Hit us up. Let us know. And perhaps, maybe who knows, maybe we can do something about it. Let's find out. Let's see how the battles are shaping up for week one. I won't give you the results yet. We'll, we'll reveal those and the votes are tallied. But for now, we got our first week's brackets. We got Schwab slash TD, a.k.a. the Leviathan of the options market. Just an enormous, enormous brokerage. <laughs> versus Tradehawk by Trade Year. That's a rough battle for Tradehawk. Then we got Tasty Works versus Vanguard. Vanguard, not big players in the option space. Let's see if they can hold their own against the upstart Tasty, now part of the uh, juggernaut of IG. Then we got uh, Robin Hood versus Lightspeed. Interesting. Lightspeed's always kind of been the little engine that could in this battle royale let's see how they hold up this week let's see if the robin hood fans or the haters come out in force we'll find out uh, merrill edge taking on gatsby one of the newer additions to the options brokerage space on the other side of the brackets we got ally invest taking on e option we've got morgan stanley slash e trade again merger mania in the space has created these monstrosities versus trading block and then we've got fidelity versus weeble so kind of an established player versus a newer addition. And then we've got uh, two kind of stalwarts going at it. IB taking on Trade Station. So get on out there if you haven't voted yet. This is your chance. Make your voice heard. Hey, you can maybe win some fabulous prizes, too. You can't go wrong. You literally lose nothing. And maybe you win. And, of course, maybe you get to vent your spleen about your broker. It's a win-win. All around, listeners, get on out there. Make your voice heard. Let's see who else is making their voice heard. Our old friend, my boy, Luigi. I do believe he was chiming in on some of our extra credit live streams yesterday. <laughs> Those aren't actually live, Luigi. So just to let you know. Those are kind of extra bonus for folks like to listen to stuff in their ear holes. But uh, we've got you here. He says, good morning. 
have been using longer term options as a stock replacement strategy. Okay, we're with you. That's a good, good one. Usually four to five months out. I know that theta speeds up around 45 days and drops off after 20. I have tried a couple of different methods, but what would be the best time to pull the position if it is not moving or going slightly against me? It just seems like whatever I try doesn't work. Should I do a trailing stop order right when I put the position on? Let's go out to the uncle list of Mike's first. Uncle Mike, you know, we talked about stock replacement before. I'm, I, don't, I don't think it's your go-to strategy, but you have been known to sling a little bit of that every now and then. What do you have to say for my boy Luigi wants to know when he should take it off? And if so, what kind of order type should he use? Well, I, I think that when you should take it off, because of the fact that options have multiple factors in it, I think you need to have um, different things going for different reasons. So in other words, let's say that you're playing with a 90 delta call option. If that's the case, then if we have a drop in implied volatility and nothing else happens, who cares? It's really not going to affect your option all that much. But let's say that you're doing something with some uh, out of the money options. Well, then you have to uh, have something in place to where in case you have a drop in volatility, uh, you're what are you going to do with that? How are you going to balance it? So typically what I like to do uh, in the stock replacement world uh, is a couple things. Um, one, I usually like to use some type of a vertical spread. So that way, it doesn't mean that volatility risk is gone, but it's at least mitigated somewhat. Uh, but then the other thing that I think it's important to do is to have something in place for when the stock goes against you relatively quickly. So let's say that you... Um, the stock itself goes down to the point where you feel that you're wrong, meaning in your analysis, if the stock goes to this level, that means that I'm wrong and the stock's not going to go my way. Have something in place for that. Uh, in regard to a trailing stop, I typically don't like them in the option space because of the fact that uh, you are... I guess just for me, the, the better way of doing it a lot of times is just sit by my computer all day. So that's how I handle that whenever uh, I have it. So um, the trailing stop in and of itself, it's tough because if you're basing it on the option in and of itself, if you have some type of a, uh, a crazy move in the middle of the day, it can really shoot the option up higher or the option down lower even more exaggerated than what the stock does. Uh, interday moves can be pretty crazy. And so I guess I'm not a huge fan of trailing stops if you're basing them on the option price in and of itself. If you have a very liquid option, uh, like something on SPY or Apple or uh, it's just a, a very liquid trading name, probably the way with which I would go about doing it is making a contingent order. Say, so in other words, let's say if the stock were to go down to a certain level to my wrong point, at that point, get me out of the option. And if it's liquid enough to where you can use a market order, and it's really not going to be that big of a deal, then I would do it. I, I personally do that uh, at times if I'm not going to be by my computer. Uh, if I'm trading an option on SPY, it's a penny bid ask spread. So whether it's a market order or a limit order, I mean, don't get me wrong, anything's possible. I prefer to be by my computer and make the limit order myself. But if I can't do it, then I just put in for a contingent market order. So I think from a risk management standpoint, what I would do is something along the lines of having a contingent order based on the stock with the option. And then just as you follow this from day to day, just say the next day, oh, the stock's up X percent, but you still want to be in the option bump the contingent order up a little bit. So you're kind of doing a trailing stop, but you're basing it on the stock and not the option in of itself. At the same time, you have to monitor volatility and you have to monitor time decay, which it sounds like you're doing along those lines uh, to make sure that uh, volatility, uh, vega and theta aren't hurting you either. So in the world of stock replacement, that's probably the best way with which to do it if you're not able to be by your computer uh, very frequently. If you don't have a guy like Uncle Mike, managing your positions for you. Mr. Meeple, I know you actually did some research into this a year or two ago about theta and its impact on various positions. We have to steer here for Mr. Luigi wants to know when, when his theta speeds up around 45 and drops off after 20, when should he pull his position? Sir? Oh, you know, that's, that's interesting. Um, yeah. I, th I think the big piece is that, you know, when they get, when you lose all the premium, 
uh, and, and you've only got, you know, 20 cents left, left a premium left in, in whatever you're holding, uh, that premium takes forever. So the real ramp is, um, you know, kind of that 60 to 30 days for out of the money options. So that's an important thing to be aware of. Um, and so generally speaking, um, you know, do I do short data trades? Yeah, I do a lot of them, but if I don't get the move I'm looking for, I get out pretty fast. Um, and, uh, you know, longer dated stuff, uh, you know, I'll, I'll wait a, a pretty long time. Um, you know, I'll start looking to roll those when they're about 60 days to expire. But, you know, generally speaking, uh, yeah, some of those little baby premiums take forever to, uh, to come out. So, uh, you know, that would be my, my general thoughts without knowing the exact position that he's trading. A lot of people are asking about our outlooks for specific underlyings. <laughs> Bumbling Trader wants to know, what's the outlook on Denison Mines and AAU? AAU is not a name we've talked about on the show. That's Almaden Minerals trading a whopping 54 cents <laughs> right now. So I'm guessing it's not very hot and heavy on the options front. Let me pull it up really quickly to see if there are any legacy options on this name actually there are some strikes going all the way up to seven and a half <laughs> not much oi but there are some some strikes out there so if you want to sell a two and a half strike put that's oh two bucks in the money you can do so right now for whoever has the inclination so we haven't talked about aau dennis and mines we talked about briefly because it popped up on our odd block listeners and it was one of the ones that was just too attractive they were paying north of 30 cents for two and a half calls when the stock was trading around a buck. So yeah, I did a ton of those. And then when, the, when they, I took those off when they went away pretty quickly, which they did, that vol imploded and I sold calls lower down for about 25 to 30 cents again. So you got to sell them a couple of times over the course of that. And the stock pretty much was right around here when it took it off. All my positions in, in Denison are gone now. Those are all short term, very short lived is taking advantage of the dislocations that were created by the option. So I don't, I don't have any outlook going forward. If those things get rich again, I'll come in and do that again, but I'm not sitting here holding a bunch of Denison right now. And if someone else wants to know, Asalim was in our live chat earlier this week. He wanted to know, hi there. Just found this while researching Exxon mobile thoughts on Exxon mobile for the end of this week. This is not a underlying stock show. A lot of places you can go for that. People's thoughts on the fundamentals and everything like that. We are here to talk about the options and the options flow and everything else that's interesting. And if that informs some of what we're seeing about the underlying, sure. But this is not, not your first stop here for underlying outlook. You can, that's, that's a dime a does. You can go listen to Kramer if you want to hear that all day. He'll, he'll give you opinions on every underlying under the sun, whether he knows it or not. But <laughs> all right, let's keep on rolling here to uh, Rob Clem. Rob Clem wants to know, what indicators do any of you use to trade options on the spy? Uh, Mike, I, I think you're kind of our resident technician just because the meatball and I don't really use technicals very often. And also you trade spy. So you get nominated to answer this one, sir. What indicators, if any, do you use to trade your spy options, sir? I just, I, I did not hear the question. My apology. It's technology cut out until you said, Mike, are you there? Well, Mike, uh, Mark, I, I'll chime in if you don't mind. I watch, uh, you know, I use my, the VIX as my main indicator for spy. Uh, you know, I've got my VIX traffic light that I use. And the big thing that I, you know, for the, the newer trader, one of the things I'll say is, Watch how the VIX is correlating with the SPY. When the two start to move together, that is a really good sign that the market is turning around. So when you see the S&P rallying with the VIX rallying or the SPY falling and VIX is falling or, or flat uh, at the same time, those are our inflection points where the market has a very high tendency to uh, make a move usually in the opposite direction. So that's the uh, SPY indicator I use, although it's not technical analysis. Uh, the only TA I use is the 50-day and the 200-day. Uh, and, and that's more just to kind of get like broad-based levels. I never thought of VIX as, I mean, it is an indicator if you think about it. I just never thought of it in that category. But you're right. It does it does work in that capacity. I guess if you think of it that way, I guess I use VIX that way as well. I, just, I never put it in that same category. But there you go. There's our technicals. It's VIX. <laughs> Robe, or I should say Rob Clem out there. As we keep on rolling into our final segment, it is time to go around the block. It's time to tell you what we'll be watching on our trading screens until the next episode. It's time for Around the Block. 
All right, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to squeeze in one more. I'm nice. I like to give the folks in the live chat some love, particularly new traders here. Let's see. Producer, if you could copy that question in really quickly here, because we're kind of running up against it. But I want to make sure we get them. It's hard for me to read here on that chat. All right, now I'll just do it myself here. Hello, love the show. This comes from Killabond and about two new listener, about two months now, and new option trader. Well, welcome to you there, a Killabond. About two months as well. We, you're definitely, you're, there's definitely a lot of you out there right now, new listeners and new options traders. So you are far from alone. Thank you for all the insight. Since I trade in my uh, RRSP account, I can't trade puts. Do you have another recommendation on how to purchase stocks at a lower price? Uh, puts in the money. Well, you can RRSP. I'm assuming you mean retirement restricted in general, you know, all retirement accounts, you can, it's a kind of a misconception. You can't trade short puts in retirement accounts. You can, it's just a question of they have to be cash secured. So if you have the capital to buy, whatever it is, you want to sell puts on Ford of the 12 strike, you know, you got to have 12 grand in your account. If you want to do a 10 lot, something along those lines, if you have that, that capital side, you can trade them in most, uh, restricted accounts. I'm not sh- familiar exactly with the RRSP, but that is something you can definitely uh, do. We have to keep rolling, though. Good to see new listeners, new faces in there. New stuff coming, new wrinkles. Luigi, you're asking for the new info. It's coming. I can't let all the cats out of the bag yet, but it's coming soon. It's going to be awesome. Don't worry. You're all going to love it. So uh, stay tuned for that. Let's go around the horn. Let's go to Uncle Mike. A, do you know what the heck uh, RRSP is? And then B, what are you watching for the rest of this week, sir? I know what it is, actually. An RRSP, it's a retirement account, but it's for Canada. I had a feeling it was international. I was just about to say, I bet you it's an international designation. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, they do have a different set of restrictions in Canada. I mean, uh, so it's very possible that uh, you aren't able to sell put to do any puts in Canada. I'm not sure. I don't have any uh, RRSP clients or I don't I don't have any um, uh, Canadian resident clients so I'm not familiar with that but if, if um, that is the case and if those are the rules in Canada then um, you could just simply buy a stock and then sell an in the money covered call to create a synthetic if that's allowable uh, within an RRSP so uh, that's one thing with which uh, you could do and what are you watching for the rest of the week sir well, for the rest of the week, uh, continuing to watch the 3900 mark in the SPX. We actually crossed it uh, uh, during the show, uh, and then we crossed back down below it. So continuing to watch that. And then um, just one of the, the key numbers here of uh, 4,020 on the SPX and the VIX, just seeing uh, where we're going to be with them and how close we're going to stay to them. And then, uh, of course, as always, watching the 10-year. Uh, to see what that yield's doing. I love our listeners. Give us some good homework there, Kilabon. I'm going to look into these RRSPs. I had a feeling when I saw that that it was some sort of international designation. I'll have to look in and see if you if you can't sell a cash secure. I'd be surprised. Uh, if you can't do that, I'm going to guess the way Uncle Mike's at the synthetic version. They're probably not going to let you do that either, but the prohibition makes no sense at this point. But we'll, we'll look into it and see if we can get some insight onto the Canadian side. Our friends in the Great White North. You folks need some love, too. Mr. Meatball, what do you keep an eye on for the rest of the week, at least until Bob use tomorrow, sir? Yeah, I mean, uh, the Russell 2000 is really the uh, the dog, and the rest of the market is the tail right now. Oil, uh, and then uh, some of these NAB, NASDAQ and meme stocks, um, you know, they're all over the board, and I kind of want to know where, uh, where, you know, what the next leg is. So I'm keeping a tight a tight watch on those names. If you want to keep a tight watch on those names, just stay tuned. If you're listening live, we'll give you a little bit of a break in between. You get some fun stuff beamed in. We'll be back in pretty much exactly half an hour. Guess what? We're going to dive into all this RVX and RUT and Russell 2000 stuff in a whole bunch more detail on TWIFO coming up in a little bit less than 30 minutes. I listen after the fact. Let's hit next on your device of choice. TWIFO should be waiting for you. But we're waiting for all of our cohorts here to see what they have cooking. Let's go around the horn. Let's start with the greasiest of meatball. Mr. Meatball, I know what was causing problems for you at the top of the show was your your grand presentation day out there. So what's cooking in the land of the pit? Yeah, you know, we've, uh, we're coming at the tail end of uh, we did an all-day education event today. Uh, if you're not on our email list, then you're not going to get an invite uh, or following me on Twitter. So that's a good reason to be, do that. Uh, I'm watching uh, the Robin Hood trader. The Robin Hooders were all over uh, the cruise liners right before they uh, started to turn around today. So I'm watching them and I'm watching uh, names like AAL, which uh, continues to be a, a uh, 
and and the airlines. So yeah, uh, I'm looking for that transition back into the opening trade after a week of the the we're closing again trade uh, seeming to dominate. There we go. Interesting stuff. Also watching Russell 2000, obviously, and uh, should be interesting stuff. Check it out. Option Pit. Dot com. Mr. Uncle Mike, same question for you. Folks want to follow you on the old Twitters or check out your website. Where should they go? What should they do? Oh, follow me on Twitter, at Mike Tusoff. Uh, my website, stcharleswealth.com. Uh, what I'm doing right now is every Monday after the strategy block, I am writing an expanded edition to it and posting it on my blog and sharing it on Twitter. So uh, make sure you follow me on Twitter so you can take a look at Mike Tusoff. At Mike Tussaw, T-O-S-A-W. If you want a good dose of strategy in between episodes of this show, that's where you get it. And you know where to get access to the hottest thing out there in the world of new exchange availability for investors like you folks out there is demandderivatives.com. Two Ds, D-E-M-A-N-D, derivatives.com. Click on the equity crowdfunding tab. Small minimums is around 100 bucks, 105, 115, something in that range. And you can get a piece of the action. A volatility exchange. How cool is that? DemandDerivatives.com is the place to go. On behalf of everybody over there, Uncle Mike, the greasiest of meatballs, and indeed myself, reminding you, stay tuned. We'll be back 20-odd minutes now, 27 minutes with Twifo. Got myself, Dan Grams, the folks over there at Footsie Land. Going to be talking a lot about Footsie, so stay tuned for that as well as everything else lighting it up. We've got, I'm sure, energy. We'll have to see what's moving and shaking. you got to tune into Twifo to find out. Back again tomorrow, of course, noon central, 1 p.m. Eastern for volatility views. Then it all kicks off again on Monday. Another episode of the Option Block. This episode is sponsored by Demand Derivatives, a startup futures exchange and clearinghouse trading the world's major assets in a creative new way. You already trade on an exchange. Here is your chance to own one. Before they approach large strategic partners for funding, the pioneering team at Demand Derivatives launched a crowdfunding portal so that regular traders have the chance to buy shares. Learn more and become a part of this revolutionary fintech project now at demandderivatives.com slash crowdfunding. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. <laughs>